Taj Mahal was simple. It was just one transformation we did. But you can imagine a sphere. And here's an example. This is a sphere in two dimensions. If you just look at the, this plane, it's a circle. That's a sphere in two dimensions. It has a symmetry axis. <coughs> if I forget the painting on the, the little prints on the surface of this cup, I can rotate the cup about the symmetry axis. That's my transformation. And it's the same. And I can rotate through any angle I like. So many, many transformations. One degree, two degrees, 20 degrees, etc. In fact, if you think about it, infinite number of transformations leave a sphere invariant. Okay? So begin to pick the language up. That's the hardest part when you go into graduate school and go to a graduate program in theoretical physics. The first year, you're just trying to figure out what are those words. What do they mean by all those words? Now, if, if you think a little bit more about this, you can, you can distinguish two types of symmetries, and they really are different. One is, like I just did with the coffee cup, continuous symmetries where you can rotate through any number of degrees. On the other hand, there are discrete symmetries, and if you want an example of that, think of an infinite chessboard. So this board goes off a billion light years that way, like a billion light years that way, and so forth. And there's a rook sitting on a square. Now the rook looks around and says, well, aside from the colors of the, of, of the chessboard, and we can forget that, just make all the squares the same color. The, uh, the rook looks around and says, hmm, this is a mighty <coughs> symmetrical universe, because if I take one step to the right, it looks exactly the same. If I take 10 steps to the right and five steps up, it looks exactly the same. So that rook is living in a very symmetrical world, but he, he has to take a discrete step. In other words, there's a smallest step he can take, and he can't take a smaller one. If he takes a half a step, then he says, well, it doesn't quite look the same because I'm now on a line here, and, and I got, I'm sitting in the middle of this square. I've got to take a discrete step to get to the middle of that square so that my universe looks the same. That's how an electron feels inside of a sodium chloride lattice, known as salt. <laughs> and the electron is sitting here, hovering around a sodium and a chlorine atom. And if you take that electron and move it a billion sodium chloride molecules away in one direction. You've got three dimensions now you can go in, take discrete steps. The electron's in the same, we call it, unit cell. So if you want to analyze condensed matter physics, atoms and whatnot, this symmetry is of fundamental importance. All you have to do is understand what's going on in a unit cell. And that is very sensitive to the shape of the lattice. The lattice may be cubic where every direction, x, y, and z, has the same step. Or it could be sort of squashed a little bit on its side, rhomboidal, or one dimension could have a slightly larger step than another. Every material we find in nature that has crystal structure has some lattice like that. And it affects the, the spectrum of spectral lines of atoms and molecules that sit in the crystal. It determines whether or not it's going to be a conductor or a semiconductor, or an insulator with respect to electricity. But you have to focus on the unit cell. And once you've solved that problem, you've solved the whole crystal because of this remarkable symmetry. What is it then about a continuous symmetry that makes it uh, so different? And in fact, I'll tell you, all of the continuous symmetries that can exist in mathematics were classified about 1900. And the discrete symmetries could not be classified. They were very, very difficult. They were only classified finally until about, until about the 1970s. And, and lots and lots of computer programs were written to analyze them. Why are discrete symmetries harder to analyze these things than these things? What is so special about continuity of a mathematical function? Some of you are studying a subject right now that is entirely based upon this. You know what it is? When, when they, you know, it, often you learn these terms in mathematics and the teacher doesn't yet get to why it's important. 
But what's the key thing that's so important about continuous functions? Who's taking calculus? Well, it, you're taking a subject that only exists for continuous functions. Because with continuous functions, you can zoom in. Think of it as zooming. There's a continuous function. You can keep zooming, zooming, zooming in on some region of the function like here. You can blow it up. If you keep blowing it up enough, eventually most continuous functions are going to be more or less regular. They're going to look like a straight line there. And now you can talk about the slope of that straight line that matches that little region. That's called the derivative. If I have a function, y is a function of x. I can talk about the slope at any point x. And that's called dy dx. And if I know this, the derivative, if the derivative is simple, if I know information about it, I can reconstruct the function. Now let's think about a discontinuous function. Discontinuous function looks like this. Okay. So at this special point x, the function hops from one value to another. So as we start to zoom in, there's nothing smooth in that region. There's a big hop. So if we were to zoom in, what we see here is the function behaving smoothly, then taking a big jump to the moon, and then behaving smoothly again. So at that special point, the, the derivative slope at that point doesn't mean anything. That function is far more complicated than this function. Well, for continuous symmetries, we can talk about the rate of change of the object under a small rotation. And for a sphere in three dimensions, think of a basketball. Here's basketball. You can rotate about the x-axis. You can rotate around the y-axis a little bit. You rotate around the z-axis. If I talk about all the transformations I can do on a basketball, leave it invariant, an infinite number. But if I talk about rates of change of the basketball with respect to small transformations, there are only three. Rotations about x, y, and z. We have therefore taken the rotation group in three dimensions, the symmetry of the sphere, and reduced it to three objects called generators. And those three generators satisfy an algebra. And if you know that algebra, you know all you need to know about the groups and about the symmetry. The mathematicians figured this out. They were able to classify all, this is called a Lie algebra. They were able to classify all Lie algebras. I'll show you how it works a little bit later. And they understood immediately all continuous symmetries. But these you can't do that with. And this is a real mess. Fortunately, just about everything we talk about involves this. What's it got to do with physics? Here's quark. The quark comes in three colors. Red, blue, or green. Yellow. Let's call it yellow. Red, blue, yellow. Now the quarks are sitting inside the proton. Any, any instant there's a complete color balance. There'll be one red quark, an up quark maybe, one uh, blue quark, another up quark, and one yellow quark. That's the uh, down quark. Up, up, down, but completely color balanced. Okay. Now there is, if we think of this group, it's like a sphere in three dimensions. However, they're actually complex dimensions. Yeah, but they're actually complex numbers instead of real numbers. So it turns out there are eight generators. Because you see, you can take the real red and rotate it into the imaginary blue. So if you do the counting, you'll get eight. There are particles called gluons. The gluons are exactly matched to the generators of the symmetry. So the red quark can turn into a blue quark emitting a red anti-blue gluon. That's one of the eight generators of this color group. And the blue quark can absorb the, 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 the anti-blue red gluon and turn into red. And this is happening inside the proton. Once every 10 to the minus 24 seconds, the gluon hops back and forth between the two of the quarks. And it holds the proton together. So this is all something that comes directly out of here. Well, OK. This sounds very vague and mysterious, right?